Hello and welcome to the Monster Mechanics Podcast, where we take creatures of myth and media and see how they can be improved. I am your host, Scott Paladin, and with me as always is the R2-D2 to my C-3PO, Zach Jakeways. What are we talking about today, Zach? This week we're talking about Wookiees. So Wookiees, yes, uh, we are delving back into Star Wars species. Wookiees, if you haven't seen them for some reason, are a um, two meter tall, seven, seven and a half foot tall, furry it looks like a Sasquatch um, creature from the Star Wars universe, uh, the most famous individual of which is Chewbacca. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're big and they're tall and they're covered with fur and they've got claws. They don't tend to wear pants, I assume, because it's covered. their their junk is covered with fur. God, can you imagine trying to wear pants with that much body hair? So much pinching and pulling. Yeah, yeah. So they're interesting, I think, because they are, we know a little bit about them from like the Star Wars extended like universe stuff, the the legends information and things. We know, like, actually, although we might have seen there, I can't. It's been a long time since I saw the prequels. If we ever actually saw their home world, oh, of Kashyyyk with like three f-ing wise. I know they've they showed it in. Uh, I want to say either Clone Wars or yeah, I think it was Clone Wars. It's it's probably in Clone Wars. I I haven't seen Clone Wars because I keep trying to start it and I can't get anywhere with it. I know it's supposed to be one of those ones that gets good, but like. That means I have to I have to slog through that first season and I've never made it. Anyway, we know some stuff about about Wookiees and um, specifically that they are an ar- arboreal species. They live up in trees mm-hmm. and they have like retractable claws and they're covered in hair. And they I don't know, man, like I feel like there's there's meat for us to screw around with these guys a little bit. Sure. Uh, they're so iconic. But yet we in the mo- in the mind of most people, we know so little of them, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, they can they can understand uh, common or I think that, I think they call it common and basic. The, basic, you're right. Common is D and D. Basic is is Star Wars. Yes. So they can understand basic, but they can't speak it. Mm-hmm. So that says something about like their vocal cords or something like that. But they are you know they're obviously intelligent creatures, sentient. You know, able to pilot and repair spaceships and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're also supposed to live hundreds of years. Like they're supposed to be like a super long lived species. Interesting. Which is interesting. Yeah. If anybody doesn't know this, they were they were supp- originally supposed to be in Return of the Jedi. The the Wookiees were going to be the take the role of the Ewoks. But if I now this 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 fact might be apocryphal. It was cheaper to hire little people than it was to hire tall people. Hmm. And so they decided to go with with Ewoks instead. I see. Yeah. Um that's uh that's a thing. Anyway, uh <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's an unfortunate. Like, and of course, we've all lost our reverence for uh, George Lucas, who, when he made that decision, said, "Oh, what are we going to call them? Ewoks, Wookies? Oh, well, yeah." I was like, "I'll just take the the word that I was going to use, Wookie, and I'm just going to pull the end of it off and put it in the front, and that's it. We're just going to go with that, <laughs> and otherwise keep everything else the same. There's still an arboreal species that lives in trees and like is furry and runs around a, a forest. Like it, yeah. Anyway, yeah." Uh, minimum possible effort is what that series was about. Well, let, let's go put some effort in. Yeah, let's go put some effort in. I we were talking before air. I am struck with some similarities between the Wookies and sloths. Okay, I can see it. The the Wookie fur, which is uh, in the costumes, it's actually yak hair, but the Wookie fur has that same sort of quality to it that sloth fur does. Um, mm-hmm. Very wiry. Yeah, kind of, and and quite long and kind of lank. I guess is the way I'm thinking of it. Like it, it kind of flows. Yeah. It doesn't have stiffness to it. Mm-hmm. And then also, like, sloths have big old claws. They live in trees. They've got those long limbs. Like, mm-hmm. with with the exception of the face, I think that the oh, the overall build of the Wookiee is actually quite sloth like. I can see it. Yeah. And then there was a there was a a time uh, up up to a couple thousand years ago, probably when like big ground sloths were a thing. I mean, there was the like I forget what exactly what the megalonyx. I think was like the. The, there was at least one that was like two stories tall, like it was as big as a giraffe, mm-hmm. and they moved around the the old forests of the the ice yeah. age. So yeah, you can totally imagine a a really big like sentient sloth as the basis for something like the Wookiee. Well, well to, to pile into that, I kind of like the idea that maybe there's like a giant two story tall Wookiee. Yeah, I know that when I was young, one of the fir- one of the things that was like this seems weird is that if they I was pointed out on a forum somewhere that like, Oh, well, Chewbacca is like an adolescent. Somebody was like, that was a, that was a factoid that got thrown around at the time. He's very, he's a very young Wookiee. Cause they, cause Wookiees are supposed to live hundreds of years. 
So maybe he's only like half grown. Like maybe they get bigger. I like that. Like he's they're gonna have to remodel the uh, the Millennium Falcon to fit him in a couple hundred years. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I like, I like let's 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 roll with that. Okay. The adaptations that come from being a sloth work very well for making a mammal that lives in trees. Mm-hmm. For example, those big old claws are less about like tearing and ripping and being weapons, but they're really mostly about grabbing onto uh, tree limbs and holding onto them. Mm-hmm. In fact, the way their ligaments are are, sele- are set up, they actually have to consciously open their hands. If they relax their hands, they close up and hook onto things. So it's a conscious effort for them to open their hands. So you can imagine that, that Wookiees might be the same way, that like they're like... Mm-hmm. They have to constantly, they will always have their hands and feet kind of curled up a little bit. They just got big old chip clips for hands. Yep, exactly. Ooh, and you can imagine like the Millennium Falcon having a bunch of, instead of like Chewbacca walking around the ship, it has a bunch of like monkey bars and stuff around it. And he just like moves, like he never touches the ground. He's just grabbing onto things as he moves through the ship. That's pretty cool. I, I wonder like in the, the Star Wars universe, like all, all the ships always seem to have artificial gravity. But like, what if, what if they didn't? Like, I feel like. This would be a species that would actually be very well adapted to move, moving around a ship with no with no gravity. Oh, yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah, that's really cool. In addition to that, the this, this, this step I always want to take it is one further, which is when you do have artificial gravity, why is it always the entire ship is in the same orientation? Like, yeah. why couldn't you have a ship where the orienta- like, the hull is always outward and you're always looking up to the outside mm-hmm. of the ship? Or that it's like built into like a banana shape and like the curves of the decks are across that banana shape or something. Like surely there are more interesting ways to lay out your spaceship than like an apartment building. Yeah, there's got to be like more practical ways. Like if, if you can just like generate like this is this is down. Yeah. Like for any particular point on a ship, like have fun with that. Like, yeah. You know, instead of having an elevator, which takes you up two stories or whatever, you walk into a tube and then for the like you step into it and then your down is up for a little while and so you float upward and then mm-hmm. you get to a section where the that reverses and you start to decelerate and you come, like you literally just kind of like walk into a tube and the gravity system just takes over you don't need a, like a housing around you or anything it just like yeah. moves you through or or like a you step into a vertical hallway where like you the 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 stuff tur- changes for a while and you walk up the wall of the hallway and then come out on the other like there's such cool stuff you could do with that i also just love the idea that maybe there's like um issues with with the gravity malfunction and like someone's just walking along a flat surface and like part of the, the gravity generator shorts out and suddenly you're just slammed against the ceiling shatter all your bones just walking down a, a simple simple hallway yep uh, it's also a really that'd be a really good way to assassinate somebody too, like to to rig the mm-hmm. the the gravity system on the ship to like target them, like the room they're in or something like that, and just release like mm-hmm. hundreds of G's all at once. Okay, back to what we were talking about, which is Wookies. If if we're gonna borrow from the Wookies or borrow from the sloths for the Wookies, I think we need to look at the the fun. I think we need to look at the fun sloth facts, like the fact that moss grows on them if they're if they're slow enough, like they will actually like get a plant material will grow on them and they'll turn green interesting yeah they also only poop and pee once a week they only excrete themselves once a week they they climb down from their trees in order to release all of their excrement in a single go um which apparently is like a third of their body weight so you know i guess that's a bad day of the week uh on the millennium falcon when uh (laughs) chewbacca finally finally lets loose and i thought they smelled bad on the outside this is another pet peeve of mine. Spaceship designers never put a toilet in like you, you will, you will sometimes. OK, well, the Millennium Falcon may be special because Millennium Falcon like layouts never work like they always have like the floor plan and the outside model and the two of them never match up well ever. So I guess that one gets a little bit of a pass because it can't possibly be true. But like on the um, uh, like if you, you get the deck plans of the Star Trek USS Enterprise and like mm-hmm. there is a single toilet on the entire like 700 meter long spaceship has, has a crew of, you know, 50, but yeah, oh, no, no. If I'm thinking of the enterprise D it's like a crew. Of, it's a thousand people with a single toilet. That is a bad time. Unless they're using the transporters to get poop directly out of people's colons <laughs> or they're pulling a JK Rowling where they're pooping on the floor and then transporting it away. Wait, what? 
Oh yeah, they didn't hear about that. J.K. Rowling says that um, in in the time before, according to her Twitter account, of course, in the time before indoor plumbing at Hogwarts, the uh, wizards used to just poop on the floor and then use their magic to whisk it away. This is apparently canon now for the for the Harry Potter universe, which is why I'm glad I I I pretty much missed the whole Harry Potter thing. Like I did not read it when it was out. I read it later and then immediately read uh, Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality and liked it better. So that's my version of it, which is still not good in a lot of ways, but it's at least better. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there's a lot of things to, to, to poke holes in with Harry Potter. Maybe we can do that with our, uh, one of our episodes one time. Yeah. So. The, the only trouble with that one is there's so few like monsters in it, like that they actually show up for any amount of time. Like, Everything was monster of the week. Yeah, it's so flat. They show up for not even like a week. They show up for like a, a minute, you know, like there's mm. the longest one maybe is the basilisk. It's, it's a whole book where it's kind of hanging around, but mm. we could just do a basilisk episode. So anyway, yeah, I'm going to have to cut all of that because <laughs> as we just dunk on Harry Potter for a few minutes. <laughs> so talking about, yeah, toilets, um, toilets on spaceships. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so and I, I think the. Obviously, they can move our Wookiees, our sloth like Wookiees can move at a good pace and they can keep, you know, they can keep track with with humans. I think obviously uh, Wookiee metabolism is such that they can speed up like they are. They're an infuriating uh, companion to have if they can just have they're only ever going to move at sloth speed. Oh, yeah. Something about them. They can ramp up and down on their metabolism. I'm just picturing a dash from Zootopia replacing Chewbacca. Chewie, punch it. Okay. <laughs> I appreciated the blue shift on that, that Wookiee noise there. <laughs> yeah, so they they obviously have the ability to um to move fast occasionally. Maybe that makes them they're obviously too to me, they're too big to be a prey species, especially if they're arboreal. If they're like living up in the trees, there's not gonna be anything bigger than them eating them. But if you look at Chewie's teeth, that dude is a, probably a predator. Maybe, maybe you could make the argument they, they look do look a little bit like gorilla teeth because gorillas have mm. have some fangs like that, and they're they're vegetarian. But I, I'm looking at Chewbacca that that says that maybe he occasionally eats the you know eats a meat. You don't, you don't get a phrase like "let the Wookiee win" without a oh, Wookiee having eaten someone before. Yeah, I, I, so maybe they are a um, like they have two modes. Well, one is when they are. They're sort of low on food. They haven't eaten in a little while. They're conserving all of their energy in order to have like one big burst of motion all at once. Mm -hmm. They will like subsist off of like leaves and and bark and things like that. They can like just chew on the on the trees that they're living in and to, mm -hmm. to sustain themselves. And then when something gets close enough, they can spring into action and become very active really quickly and start like swinging through the tree like a like a chimp style, you know. Mm -hmm. And moving very quickly to track something down and tear it apart and eat it, uh, which I think is suitably terrifying for it. Yeah, I like that. And then, so this is this is sort of like the biological basis for it. This is their this is their chimp version, you know, their Australopithecine version of them of the of the Wookiee. Because as they evolved into a more sentient species, it seems like they're maybe spending a bit more time in that fast mode as time goes on, because they develop things like tools where they can hunt mm -hmm. more frequently and get more access to more calorie dense. Uh, meats. Yeah, they learned how to cook food. Yep, and uh, and also you know they build things, but they still have. I, I like the idea they still have access to that ability to, to slow their metabolism down and just become very slow and not use a lot of mm -hmm. energy. I like that is also explains their long lifespan. That like maybe they don't the the natural lifespan of a Wookiee isn't me me measured in years. It's measured in like miles. Like it's mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how quickly they get somewhere. It matters how much they move. Interesting. I also like the idea because it can kind of go into this dormant state. Mm -hmm. Like I like the idea that maybe, uh, and because they live so long, uh, maybe their their original modes of like hyperspace travel were just kind of like doing it like the long way. Oh yeah, they were one of the few species that managed to travel to other worlds before they invented hyperspace. Mm -hmm. Access to hyperspace. Yes, that is cool. Uh, where they all just get into their ship and they set the autopilot. And then they all just slow down mm -hmm. until they get to the next place and they speed up and they're like, oh, this is fine. This is great. And everybody else is like when like they make contact with a hyperspace uh, capable species, they're like, you do what now? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. 
this is something that would that that bothers me a little bit. What would Wookiee ships be like? Because we see lots of human ships in the Star Wars universe, but like our versions hmm. of Wookiees would design spaceships very differently. I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, On just to start out with, they're definitely not made of wood. Like no. they, this isn't some like they're not like the tribal spaceship, right? Like they're just mm-hmm. they they develop their own advanced technologies that they they apply their own de- designs and stabilities to. Okay. So like maybe they I, I love the idea that they they don't care about gravity the way that we do. So like mm-hmm. g- like you mentioned earlier that they just they put a bunch of handholds all over their ships and then they just don't bother putting any anti or, or artificial gravity in. Mm-hmm. And they also maybe because of that might be a little bit less concerned about which way is up. Like their their ships might not have a like everything in Star Wars is always designed with a very like clear sort of upside. Like, you know, the mm-hmm. Star Destroyers are always depicted with their uh, their bridges uh, on the on the upper half of the screen. And they're mm-hmm. like very meant they are very obviously always meant to be shown in a certain orientation. And whenever they're in space, they all line up the same way. Like they never just like floating around in different configurations. And maybe that's a knock on effect of everybody using artificial gravity. So they sort of orient themselves that way. Whereas mm-hmm. When Wookiees build their ships, they're like, ah, whatever. It looks like a cluster of, you know, tree trunks or something like that. It looks like a like cylinders that have been welded together or something. I was thinking like if like they're trying to be efficient and whatever, and like mm-hmm. their their primary mode of transportation is like like swinging from branch to branch. I feel like they're going to have like a lot of like ar- arches for um uh, for for corridors and connecting things like that. So everything might be just kind of like um kind of like these sweeping designs that are designed to like allow a Wookiee to tra- traverse from one place to another with just like one swing as opposed to like walking down a hallway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see that. Yeah. So these sort of like graceful curves and stuff like that. Yeah. And it, and it looks kind of like a, um, like I said, maybe like an, a, um, like, like a, like a big pine cone maybe or something like that, where instead of being a, like a, like a wedge, like the, um, mm-hmm. like the Star Destroyers have, it's kind of conical and has like segments on it and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that could be kind of cool. And yeah, their their original version of it didn't even have hyperdrive. They just like fired themselves off and then went to sleep. And they mm-hmm. weren't con- so concerned about like, well, will my family be there when I get back? Because like, no, the, yeah, they're fine. They're also going to live hundreds of years. <laughs> they don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what about uh, what about the bowcaster? The, 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 the famous weapon that mm-hmm. Chewbacca uses. He uses this big old crossbow thing. Like from what I can tell, like, it's basically just a blaster with, with a crossbow bar. So supposedly in universe, it fires what it calls blaster bolts. And it uh-huh. like you, you actually have to cock that thing. Like the reason why Chewie is the only one who uses it is because he's the only one strong enough to go and like actually like shotgun it in mm-hmm. order to load the next shell. Which they toss out with the no, the last three movies, but. Actually, no. He no. cocks it and then hands it to han apparently han only ever shoots it like once and then hands it back and it's like i like that thing but also i mean there's lots of other problems with those movies but I, mm-hmm. there is an excuse for that one thing <laughs> all right but i do like the idea of them having access to kinds of weapons that only their great strength would have okay yeah uh would allow them access to like maybe a really a, a, a maybe a slightly um more believable example because the bowcaster to me implies that somebody had to make this specifically for Wookiees. Like this was designed for themselves. Mm-hmm. And maybe the, another good option is that they, the, the big like tripod guns that you see the stormtroopers use where like they mm-hmm. run into an area, they put a tripod down and then they put a blaster down on top of that. And then they fire it. You could just see a Wookiee just pick that shit up and like haul it around Arnold Schwarzenegger style. Oh yeah. As well. They also, they have those big long arms, um, mm-hmm. and you have to imagine that they can, they could probably throw things really well, like, yeah. because they can get just a huge amount of speed by like whipping it around. So you could imagine them using like bolos or even just like really good, they have a, a really good, um, grenade, uh, arsenal or like things that they could just pull out of their bandolier and hurl at you because they're going to get you like, they're going to be able to land it right where they want to over a huge distance at great speed. Yeah. I like that. Like they don't, they don't understand the idea of a grenade launcher because they, their arms are grenade launchers. And, uh, I mean, like obviously with their, their strength, um, things like melee weapons are going to be, uh, like oversized or, or handcrafted to maximize the, the use of, and I also like the idea that maybe, um, like there's such a thing as like drop wookies. Oh yeah. Where they fall on you. Yeah. 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 
100 percent love it um yeah th- this is why like that that would that would be an excellent improvement to the the battle of endor in Re- return of the jedi where instead of these little these little dudes throwing uh uh logs at the stormtroopers you just like a, one of those little chicken walker ATSTs is walking along and there's a Wookiee just falls onto the top of it, rips the top of it off because he's super strong mm-hmm. and then just goes in there and you just see like blood spraying out the top because <laughs> they're horrible can or not. Uh, they're, they're like incredible predators who could just rip you apart. Yeah. So, OK, so this actually makes we were, we were talking a little bit about how so they might be one of the first space bearing species because they were able mm-hmm. to do it before the invention of hyperspace. Uh-huh. What that says to me is that like. Rather than being like this little backwater, this tiny race that like our species, this tiny ra- species that gets like overrun by the by the galaxy, you know, the first the new first the Republic and then the Empire. Like mm-hmm. I like the idea that no, they were at the core founding of all of this stuff, and like they are part of the backbone of galactic society because they were the first ones to do it. Like before anybody else got off the ground, the the uh, Wookies had already colonized a bunch of worlds. Interesting. I think that's cool. So um, one of the uh, one of the things that's touched on uh, with Chewbacca is is the uh, the idea of the life debt. Yeah. Um, there's also mention that like uh, historically Wookiees were were often a slave species. Yeah. And I'm wondering like if the life debt kind of ties in with that, hmm. and if there's anything we can do to like kind of disentangle the two or uh, explore that further. I I always kind of had a head canon that the life debt thing was just Chewy. A little bit mm-hmm. where like he was trying to explain like again this is entirely just me making it up but i always kind of thought that like that was a thing that chewbacca had thought up and like felt like he owed han solo and like used that as an explanation for why they're like heterosexual life partners you know where he's like this is the easiest way for me to explain how i feel like you are my partner and so like i and like and like that's what like but then he, he tries to explain that to han solo whose mind doesn't work like that and he's like Oh, he, I he owes I owe, he owes me a debt. Okay, that's why he's my friend, and not like he, you are my best friend, and I love you super much. Like, <laughs> like it just he's like I'm uh, I'm not getting Wookie married. <laughs> yeah, like it it was like a mistranslation thing, and it like didn't hmm. really work that way. Um, because like I feel like especially later, like after you know, basically after uh, a New Hope, like I feel like Chewbacca has totally paid back whatever life debt was given to him. Like he's hmm. dude. The dude has got it fine. Like he could, he sh- he could be able to walk away from that with a completely free conscience. But I think he mostly just likes Han and like wants mm-hmm. to hang out with him, and also knows that Han would be completely like useless without him. And is like, I need to keep track of this little dude. He's gonna get himself killed. Yeah. So maybe uh, I like transforming the idea of the life debt into just yeah, Wookie married. You called it like it's the their version of of their um, their partnership which is not mm-hmm. necessarily romantic. You know, they, mm-hmm. they just, they, they pick somebody else and make them part of their family. Yeah. They're just like, Hey, you, you are useful to have around. I like being around you. Yeah. Let's never go apart. Yeah. And that makes, you could, you could totally imagine that the way their culture works is that after they become adults, like they go off and form like a troop, like they go off and form a new family that is mm-hmm. specifically divorced from their bloodlines. Like they could go and find new blood, like this is your like hunter group or something like that. And okay. sometimes if there are if there are members of that same group that are opposite gendered, then you will you know, like generate some kids out of that. But like mm-hmm. mostly it's about like forming a little found family of people that you feel very strongly about and that it like forms this tight knit little community. And so Chewbacca has like done that with this one dude. Like he's like, oh, OK, Han, you're my troop. And then like Luke and Leia comes on. He's like, OK, I guess we've adopted these children now. And Mm -hmm. (laughs) like, I I could see him just like, this is just an extension of the way that Wookiees work. Yeah, I I do like that. Um, Do you think uh, like on a whole, like uh, Wookiees will be having adopted family outside of other Wookiees or is that? I I like the idea that rarity in the version of this, of the story where they're like one of the dominant species in the universe uh, where like they were the founding members is like, yeah, I like the idea that they, they start going out and like they just like adopt, they just find people and they're like, OK, you are now a member of my family. And like, I don't even care if you really like it or not, but like you're ne- I have adopted you. You are part of my ship. <laughs> you are now my child. I do wonder if there's like um, 
like other species, like misconstruing that as a form of slavery. Like, oh yeah, like th- these Wookiees have come and enslaved my race, even though there's like, no, I'm, I'm just I'm here to hang out. Or you're my best bud. I like. I also love the idea that it, it, that something they totally get that humans also do is that they'll they'll adopt they'll take anything and make it a pet. Like that's something uh-huh. that they all like. We'll do that. We'll be like, oh look at that giant apex predator i'm gonna put it in my house and give it a collar and like a, a wookie sees that and goes yes that is exactly correct we are definitely doing that <laughs> i'm gonna have that uh uh tiger sized uh multi-legged cat as a lap <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna get in my lap and i'm gonna scratch it behind the ears because <laughs> i'm i'm also a wookie it doesn't pose any threat to me <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, I live long enough that I can oversee the breeding program on this to domesticate it. <laughs> yeah, that's yes, exactly that. They're like, go to planets and they're like, that thing could be adorable in about five or 10 generations. Okay, let's get started. <laughs> yeah. So, you, and every time you get to like a Wookiee dominated ship, it's like a menagerie. There's animals everywhere because they keep like, every time they land on a planet, they get more of them. Okay. I love that. I love the idea of like, a walking menagerie or like a, a flying menagerie ship. Yeah. And I also like they do this. Like, that's just a thing that like you can expect on a Wookiee ship. Yeah. 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 So like if, you know, you're in the middle of your star Wars fan fiction or whatever you're talking about, Oh, like we need a, um, we need the, the, ex- the excretion of a particular kind of snake or something like that. And you're like, Oh crap. We need, <laughs> Oh wait, there's a Wookiee colony, like two light years that way. They're going <laughs> to have one because they always have just tons and tons of animals. <laughs> And sure enough, this incredibly poisonous snake is just like a little old wiki lady's favorite pet, you know, and like <laughs> she's knitted it. She's knitted it a little sweater, you know. <laughs> OK, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> OK, is there anything else we want to pull out? Is there let's look back at our at our sloth facts and see if we missed anything. They can starve to death on a full. Sl- oh, my God. That one picture of a sloth. Sloths are cute most of the time. But not all of the time. I'm going to send you this image. Sometimes they look like. No, I'm, I think I'm looking exactly at the one you're talking about. <laughs> the nightmare creeping zombie sloth. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, now I have that up on two screens. <laughs> um, yeah. So I like the idea that they are. Uh, let's go back to that. They can grow plants on their fur idea. Okay. Yeah. We've already done a little bit of this with with some other ideas, but I, I do like the idea that they can. Maybe they maybe they go so far as to even like weave things into their fur like little plants and and like so there there are things like i think orchids technically count as this where they're called like air plants they're not really ever meant to be in the ground Uh they actually live up in trees and they can get their nutrients and moisture uh just from the air and um sometimes they're also a little bit parasitic off of the off of the creature of the plants that they land on Mm -hmm. but that's entirely the wookie's natural environment in this version where like they're up in the canopy all the time so you could actually imagine them taking what, like an orchid and like mm-hmm. weaving their hair around its roots so that it like is hanging. It just like lives on their back, you know, because they like the look of it. I also like the idea that maybe um, like this behavior started as a sort of a, a matter of convenience. Like uh, they're like, OK, like sometimes we just need like a little kind of snack or something like that. We don't want to spend all our, our energy on going and hunting. So I'll just. I'll just start a little farm on my back. And it also doubles as camouflage then for, for ambush predator mm-hmm. hunting. Yeah, absolutely. So like they're, they're, they look like giant, they can have a giant ghillie suit basically of all of the things that they have like woven into themselves. That's cool. Yeah. These like walking swamp things sometimes like one thing also to, to remember as you're making things like this is to not make them monolithic. Mm-hmm. There's a temptation to sort of make a species and you're like, all of these guys are basically the way that I am describing it. And it's so easy to to fall into the idea of like, well, that makes them all kind of caricatures and makes that entire species boring. So maybe the like the 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 Wookiees who cover themselves in, in plants, they still exist and that's a style that some mm-hmm. of them like. But there are other populations that do other things, like they uh they braid their fur or maybe they even shave sections of themselves or something like that in order to provide different looks. Oh yeah. And then you could Maybe even see, well, maybe you probably would see some version, some, some Wookiees who do like a, uh, like a combination of the two, you know, like they've, mm-hmm. they've got dyed fur on their front and they've got plants on their back and they're like, they, this is just Wookiee fashion. You know, it's like how they sort of identify what, what culture on the planet they're from. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. 
one planet to another, since they're so widespread, you'd think there'd be variants over time. Mm-hmm. I also like the idea that like maybe if, like there's like some holdover from like a hunter gather society mm-hmm. where like like you'd have like these Wookiees that just have like all these like high nutrient foods. Like so like not all Wookiees would do it, but like a few of like the, the farmer type Wookiees would have like these high nutrient foods woven into their sweet potatoes on their back. <laughs> I was thinking like gourds or pumpkins or yeah, something. Yeah. But yeah. Also good. And just just the weird things you could do to kind of like change up the silhouettes of Wookiees. I love it. They might, ooh, if they're, if they're also big into like, uh, braiding their own hair into patterns and stuff, you can see some people mm-hmm. will do wild stuff with that. Like you'll see the, oh, yeah. um, like the beard competitions where like a guy will make an entire bird cage out of his beard. Mm-hmm. Um, so they might actually have like, they might like sew pouches and things or, or weave pouches that like are directly integrated into their fur as well. Um, where like they've got pockets built in. Or they've got a, a hair baby yarn for whatever animal they're they're domesticating at this particular moment. You'd be like, you, you know, you meet a Wookiee and they're like, you want to see something? You want to see something cool? And they're like, you're like, what? Uh? And then like they they open up a little like whole, like a little thing on their chest and there's just a baby bird. <laughs> and they're like, feed the baby bird some some seeds and then they close it. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to go with like a little, uh, like a, a chest burster kind of thing where you just open up the, the hair compartment and... <laughs> <laughs> or it's that and they're like isn't this adorable <laughs> yeah that's kind of amazing uh this is much better uh than the original ones uh especially that awful i, I still have the freaking grandpa Ch- Ch- Chewie's dad or mom or whatever that looks like a, a sour apple face on my screen I, just... keep, I keep looking at it and by the way okay so you know the the jack-o'-lantern idea or the jack-o'-lantern uh, tradition of carving pumpkins. Mm-hmm. Apparently that was originally done with turnips. And I'm going to tell you that they look f-ing horrifying. This is, do you, do you have a, a link for me or do I have to go hunting for this myself? Apropos of nothing. I'm sticking it. I'm going to make our zoo, our uh, signal chat even worse. Oh God. Yeah. That's, that's some dark soul. Sh- Ugh. Anyway. Okay. Uh, I'm going to minimize that now. <laughs> Okay, so we also talked a little bit. We mentioned really early on the idea that they get big. They get really big. Mm-hmm. So we, we hadn't really mentioned that when we were talking about their their ships. But, like, I would imagine mm-hmm. that the corridors in these ships would be, you know, huge. They'd be big enough to put vehicles yeah. through. What other changes could happen over the course of their life? They get really big. Maybe the, does they slow down more? Do they become less capable of being fast as they get older, too? Um, I feel like if they're getting larger, like, they're less able to spend time in trees unless the trees are actually able to support the weight. I think if we're going by the legends version of Kashyyyk, the trees are like miles high and like <laughs> hundreds of feet around or something like they're, they're stupidly big. Like they're bigger than redwoods. Um, hmm. So yeah, we could assume they could still live up in the trees. Okay. I like the idea that maybe over time, like just the inclination is the, um, the, the older they get, the more they spend slowed down because they're bigger and therefore need more calories. And so they sort of like the, the instinct is to just spend more and more time in that slow stupor, you know, hibernative mm-hmm. state. In fact, maybe they never, they don't really die necessarily. Maybe they just eventually just stop. Stop. Yeah. They just don't they just stop waking up. And so two Wookiees, like the, the, the quote unquote dead, the ones who've like, unless they were murdered and like killed in a violent mm-hmm. way, the ones who die of natural clauses, they're just still asleep and like you would, it would be incredibly rude to, to wake them up. And like, you just don't do that. And so like, you can imagine these like mausoleum trees that have been hollowed out from the inside and they just have these alcoves. They're full can of I alcoves. Just say, I love that, that combination of words, mausoleum trees that just evokes so much cool, <laughs> cool imagery. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So they've, they've carved these things out and they've got, they've got these, you know, they're, they're just full of alcoves that have these huge Wookiees inside of them that are that haven't moved in centuries and like Mm -hmm. nobody's really sure if that actually is true that like they could wake up if they need to but like Mm -hmm. or if they actually are dead you know like they or are now mummies or something like that but you know it's it's kind of a taboo amongst the wookies that like no you don't like do not disturb the dead like they're not really dead like they're the sleeping or something like that i'm also kind of picturing like like a a third act surprise kind of thing like the wookies are defending their home world and like all right well we need to we need to go, you know, give the giant Wookiees enough nutrients to wake them up to defend their homeland. No, I got it. I, I think I got it. This is, we forgot, we've spent this entire time talking about Star Wars and there's the Force. So, oh, yeah. as they get older, 
when they go into the stupor, they like they slow themselves down. They become force aware. Like if they are if they're up and around and like moving and stuff, then in their normal like active mode, then they're just a regular creature with no additional force sensitivity. But when they slow down, they become more aware of the force and are able to access force like sensing and things like that. And that allows them to connect with other Wookiees who are also doing the same thing. And okay. so the what I'm thinking is as they get older, they get access to something that I would think of or I would call the dreaming. That would if I was going to name it, where they they are all mm -hmm. dreaming together in a shared mind space in the force. Okay. And so eventually they get old enough and tired enough and they just go to sleep one day and they go into the dreaming and that's where they stay for the whole, for the, mm -hmm. like they're just there for the rest of time. And then in the third act, like you're talking about, one of our force sensitive Jedi heroes goes into the Wookiee dreaming, find, gets all of the, the, ver the, the tens of thousands of Wookiees who've been asleep there and are, and are still in there, still in the dreaming and like makes the big impassioned speech about how you need to come out of your stupor to what, to save the galaxy and wakes them all up. Okay. I also love the idea of giant two-story tall Wookiees with lightsabers. So yes, 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 yes. Because that's that's one thing that's always bothered me is like all the all, all the races that you kind of see that are sentient are generally fall within like the between three meters tall and like three feet tall. There's never any like massive disparities in, in size. Yeah, there there's a lot of missed opportunities there. At least once, just once, they managed to get a character who had like four arms or eight arms mm -hmm. or something ridiculous like that, which is General Grievous's cyborg body character um, mm -hmm. who just uses like four lightsabers and just spins them around like a like a freaking windmill yeah. that's like the one time that somebody went like you know we could do more with this but mm -hmm. yeah, you can imagine a um four meter tall two ton wookie with a like a like a barrel like a huge ass lightsaber that is like mm -hmm. uh, as big around as a man and it like creates this massive thing <laughs> that he like sweeps through like an entire battlefield that'd be freaking cool love yeah. it <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I definitely like the idea that they, that like, the the way that the that humanity treats the Force in Star Wars, which is like a couple of people based on like bloodline have access to this extra special power. Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's one way you could have that set up. But I like the idea that there are species out there who they get access to it in a different way, and it ha and it that affects their society in a different way. Like the dreaming in the in the Wookiees, or maybe it's something like. Like a, a, a species that never gets the ability to like telekinetically like move things like they can't like reach their hand out and have a lightsaber come to them. But like almost mm -hmm. the entire species gets access to some of the sensing abilities. So like it's super common for them to like feel the force and like be able to perceive the world around them through it. But they never get the ability to like manipulate the force in the way that others do. So what's a what's a dark side Wookiee look like? Ooh. So dark side tends to give you yellow and red eyes. So you'd see those big bloodshot, gross looking eyes. I think the hair all falls out. Like, oh. I think, I think they end up looking like, uh, um, like one of them Sphinx cats, uh, with like, or like a, like a, like a creature with mange. I, I feel like that, that zombie, uh, sloth picture you just sent me. Uh, yeah. That, that's a great way to go with and it. And they have those, and they, they have these huge claws. Maybe they, they keep them out all of the time, um, mm -hmm. instead of attracting them. Uh, yeah, that's cool. I like also like give them, uh, give them different dark force powers. Like instead of the, the force lightning, give them like the ability to like do a, a Wookiee yell that like works like a, um, Skyrim, uh, dragon shout or like it sends out a force when they scream. That'd be cool. Yeah. That'd, that'd be a really cool, very impressive on screen dynamic there. Yeah. Yeah. Almost every solution in Star, or every problem in Star Wars could be solved by being a little bit more creative <laughs> instead of just yeah. doing the the thing that you already did four movies ago again. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we don't need another planet destroying super weapon that's even bigger this time. Oh God. Anyway, uh, as much as as much as I love Star Wars, uh, my I like the last ten years have killed the Star Wars fan in me. Like I'm still a mm -hmm. fan of parts of it, but like. The part of me that like loved everything unabashedly is gone now. <laughs> I feel like they got a little bit back for me with uh, the Mandalorian. Like, so how I feel now is I'm a fan of the Mandalorian, and I'm fan. I'm a fan of the original trilogy, and I'm a fan of you know various other things. I'm a fan of the X Wing games, but I'm not a fan of Star Wars anymore. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I get that. But yeah, the Mandalorian did good. I love I, they. They've been doing a really good job of expanding that universe in a way that makes 
sense. Like mm-hmm. just to, just to praise um, John Favreau and Dave Filoni a little bit, like the addition of things like sort of like aspects of everyday life that show up in in the Mandalorian is really nice. Where it's like a much more ground level, like every you know things are just kind of happening in this universe. Admittedly, I've only seen season one, but like you know, like you see restaurants and things like where people show up and they're just like, hey, you want some soup? And he's like, yeah, I want some soup. I'm like, that's nice. I just like having that kind of stuff show up. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't realize it, but yeah, I actually really enjoy getting that kind of slice of lifestyle look into the Star Wars universe that you really didn't get with um, any any of the, the movies. They're all very space opera. Yeah. Well, it's like the the Star Wars movies are like the grandest thing that could happen in that universe at any particular time. It's always like the most important bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm always much more interested in the, like just everyday dudes experience a little bit more. Like that's, that's more interesting. Um, I, the thing I, I'm going to speak this into the world because I still think it would be cool, which is a a 10 episode mini series or, or show that is the empire, the rebel versus empire war told in the style of band of brothers. Oh, interesting. Where it's just like, it's just a unit of people like of, you follow a particular rebel cell as they go through mm-hmm. like starting the rebellion and then like fighting and you have people die and like tragedies happen and like on the ground fighting. And like maybe you have like an episode where you follow some starfighter pilots or something like that. And like just tell like no force stuff. No, like never show mm-hmm. us anything that we ever recognize, basically. Like maybe every once in a while show us like. Oh, we'll see the back of Admiral Akbar's head or something like that. Like that's that's like as little relation to the rest of the story as I want. I just want it to be like, oh yeah, I like that. Yeah, that'd be really cool. I feel like they, they kind of went that direction a little bit with Rogue One. Yes. Oh, and which is why Rogue One is amazing. Like I I love Rogue One to death because it it took it showed us a whole big different section of that universe and just like dug deep into it and mm-hmm. managed to fix problems that existed in the original narrative by like making them now like. Like, okay, so the, the the question of how did the Death Star plans get into the hands of the Rebels is one that's never really addressed very concretely in Star Wars New Hope. Mm-hmm. And now when you see that, you know, like, you know, the story and the sacrifice that was that was taken to cr- get those hands into Leia's hands at the beginning, get those plans into Leia's hands at the beginning of A New Hope. Like, it has a bigger emotional impact now. Like, it actually improved a movie that came out 30 years before its creation. And that's so cool. And we also get one of the coolest shots of Darth Vader doing his thing. Oh, he's, it, it turns him into such a drama queen. Like he, like he turned off his, his chest unit, which has lights on it. It's just so that he can make a dramatic entrance. That dude is extra. I also like that it changes. There's an interaction in, um, a new hope where like Darth Vader's like, you're a member of the rebel Alliance and you've got the, the Death star plans and I'm looking for him. And, and, Leia, who literally just came from that battle five minutes ago and who <laughs> knows he knows she's ours. Like, I don't know what the f*** you're talking about, asshole. And it's like, it completely changes that dynamic. It's not plausible at all. It's just defiant built. I love it. <laughs> okay, I feel like we have to circle back to Wookiees for at least a second yeah. before we're done. <laughs> Instead of just talking about Star Wars in general. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I I do like the idea of, of dark side Wookiees. Yes, so. for sure. Um, and I, yeah, I think also like giving a race like that the freedom to be evil is important. Yeah. Uh, one of, uh, there's a, I can't remember his name, but I'm afraid there is a an evil Wookiee, I think in the KOTOR series, um, who hmm. shows up for a while. And I remember when I played that game being like, oh yeah, an evil Wookiee. Like he's like an asshole. I like that. <laughs> like, thank God. Like we're not, they're not all just variations on Chewie. Like they all have, mm-hmm. they actually end up with their own, with their own desires and like are allowed to be realized people, which is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, for sure. Dark side Wookiees. Hell yes. Yeah. I also like the idea of making them more of a backbone race, you know, make them present in the universe because they happened to be first would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, um, we are out. Bye. Until next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Monster Mechanics. This is the time of the episode where I tell you to go to Podchaser or iTunes and leave us a five-star review to help other people find our podcast. Also, I have gotten myself wrapped up in another podcast project called Breathing Space Fading Frontiers, an anthology sci-fi audio drama, which I've done a bunch of writing for. 
Uh, if you're listening to this episode the week it came out, then there is still time to head over to the Breathing Space Twitter and to check out the open casting call. We're looking for people to uh, perform in the first half of our season. There'll be another one later, uh, but uh, look for a link in the description for that. And uh, other than that, now for the credits. Monster Mechanics is produced and edited by me, Scott Paladin, and hosted by myself and my best friend, Zach Jakeways. All of the ideas generated during this podcast are released under a do-what-the-f*** you want public license.